Uh, so welcome to the Law Be With You podcast show. This is a special Easter edition of the show, and we've got Luke Saul with us again. Uh, our episode with Luke last time, well, we've done two episodes with Luke. The first one we did is, is one of the most popular episodes of the podcast, uh, and has really been really has done well with the fandom. No way. Um, yes, yes, really, really, really popular. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so we're doing something right, and uh, I did I did promise it would be a treat, and they have responded. So so well yeah. well done, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. Um, and in fact, it's quite funny because one of my friends who's who's would consider himself quite a cynic, um, <laughs> really, and is is your namesake as well. And I won't go too much into his information to embarrass him, but uh, he he was very impressed with it. So if he's impressed with it, then. We've done pretty well. Well, I've I've a bit of cynic in me as well, so so likes attract, I guess, in that uh, in that. Brilliant, space. brilliant. So as we've promised before on the show, and I, I did talk, I did sound this out with with Luke about talking about um, the creation of Middle Earth, and I thought it's such an interesting idea and concept that you get within the Silmarillion book. Uh, it's it's the creation of the physical realm called Arda. Um, so, first question off the bat, Luke. Um, who is the creator of Middle Earth? I mean, obviously, apart from Tolkien himself. <laughs> yeah, I like having that qualifier in there because it's uh, you can you the world's so rich. Sometimes you can forget that uh, it's actually written by someone. And um, Tolkien himself would had this weird framing device where he got to a point where he claimed that he hadn't created the stories, but he'd found them, which is quite fun. But the creator of Middle Earth is named in the first line of this story, which is included in the collection that's published as the Silmarillion. Yeah. Uh, and that creator is Eru, the one uh, mm. who is described as being called uh, Iluvatar in, in Arda. And yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll mainly hear him called Iluvatar from, from here on. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now, um, going from Eru the One, Iluvatar, which is kind of a cool name. It sounds like a kind of powerful, like, Iluvatar. Like, you know, yeah. kind of, I, I don't know. I don't know I, I'm getting images of, like, heroes of the universe and He-Man and She-Ra. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a, a grand sort of narrative going on in, in the Silmarillion and the, and the Parts of the of the of the book that talk about Eru uh, are very profound, and 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 there's a lot to unpack, uh, which we're going to attempt to do on the show now, at least some of it to a degree. Um, now, one of the themes that comes out is music and the and the mm. and the valor. Now, there's a kind of situation where a song is brought into play. The valor didn't know what their music was about. Um, so in that regard, looking at the Valar, looking at this song that is played by the Valar, but not knowing what their music was about, and also not knowing um, that, e that Eru hadn't really told them what the music was about either. Yeah, so it's worth saying at the start, this, this story is very different to The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, which is more familiar yeah. writings. Um, a lot of people reckon it's much more difficult to read. I think it's more about familiarity. I think if you've read Greek or Norse myth before, or even the Bible, um, the yeah. Silmarillion will be, most of it will be quite familiar to you. Uh, mm. If not, it is, it can be a bit of a challenge just because the, the style is so different. But this first chapter that we're looking at today uh, is called Aina Lindele, which translates yeah. as the music of the Aina. Um, which is, I think, who you're uh, talk, talking about when we talk about the Valar. Again, this is where it gets a bit difficult with Tolkien and his words. Um, yeah. The Aina is a big umbrella term, the Holy Ones, which are all the mm. sort of lesser spiritual beings that Eru has made. And the Valar, we'll see later, a, a sort of specific uh, sort of family within that. Um, yeah. But this question of why didn't, Eru tell them what their music was about is fascinating and is kind of mysterious. Um, I think gets back to 
this idea that there's something profound in attaining knowledge and wisdom and skill um, through embodiment and through practice and through experience um, yeah. rather than necessarily just through through knowledge retention and learning in your head. Um, mm. That can be quite alien to us in a world, I mean, especially with the internet now when it's it's all at your fingertips. Um, yes, but, of course. Yeah, it's been shaped by enlightenment, by modernism, and um, if you're a Christian, by by Protestantism, the idea that you you learn um, sort of theological stuff through head knowledge, through reading the Bible, um, mm. we that sort of come to encompass everything that we think about about knowledge is something you understand in your head. So there's this lovely yeah. moment um, about six pages into this story where the Ainus see for the first time what their music has, uh, has wrought. And it says that they, they looked and wondered at this world that began to unfold its history. And it seemed to them that it lived and grew. And they gazed for a while and were silent. Um, and uh, you get this sort of feeling of astonishment and not so much disbelief, but kind of surprise. Um, and throughout the rest of Tolkien's stories, we'll see that repeated that, some of the best and the most profound moments are when people make decisions without foreknowledge or without understanding. So the, the ultimate yeah. one is um, Frodo's words at the Council of Elrond, where he says, I'll take the ring to Mordor, though I do not know the way. Um, and that for Tolkien was really emblematic of the enunciation of um, Mary saying to uh, the angel Gabriel, like, let it be with me as God has willed it. Um, yeah where she consents to being the mother of god even though she doesn't fully understand i think the cost that that's going to involve Mm. powerful stuff yeah Uh, really powerful stuff that is now um so you you get a sort of flavor from the silmarillion and from tolkien's thinking that that the physical experience really matters then like going from this sort of metaphysical spiritual realm, I guess, with when you're talking about the valor. Um, and then obviously the music that comes into play, which is which has brought about a sort of this this new realm. But with that comes limitations, having I guess it having to kind of learn through time and experience. It, it, would that be a sort of part of the price you talk about in terms of, you know, a price that needs to be paid? And, the, and what comes along with this song. Yeah, so I think a lot of that comes to the heart of what faith is, isn't it? It's, um, it's the idea of uh, faith is, is hoping in, in what we can't see. Um, mm. And that's something that, again, as we've spoken before, Tolkien wouldn't be avert in saying that that's a, a really christian theme and that you should believe yeah. it he's not he's not proselytizing but that's something that's really evident through um the things in his work particularly lord of the rings he kind of communicates as this story that um like the the wisdom of man is foolishness to god and the foolishness of god is wisdom to man yeah. this idea that the the things that are low and the things that are unexpected and the things that are unthought of are the things that will um eventually sort of shame the wise um and, yeah. and bring about goodness so the ring quest being this enormous risk that no one can can anticipate the the end of um but they they do it anyway and that's precisely the reason it's going to be successful is it's because destroying the ring is the thing that sauron doesn't expect um or the sparing yeah. of Gollum's life repeatedly as we've spoken about in one of the episodes before that's done, yes. that's done in faith. Um, it's almost the opposite yeah. of a wise decision. Um, yeah, and I, and I guess obviously thinking about like you talk about like and Frodo of all creatures, a hobbit mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah, a great ring of power to, to Mount Doom. Um, you'd think oh, it's, it's going to be a mighty, you know, elf or you know, one of the high noble men of, of Middle Earth, but a, a hobbit of all creatures. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, now, I guess, like you're saying that, thinking of that, this sort of not knowing everything, which is obviously this is harkening to Frodo's journey, I guess, more really. Yeah. Um, although, to be fair, it plays out in 
in you know a lot of the characters that are really part of the fellowship as well um that not know not knowing everything becomes a key payoff because as we follow the story from frodo's point of view i I guess it kind of makes me think think about sort of the hero's journey and and kind of the hero setting up setting out on this journey to get a great boon or, or prize and working with others to reach the goal frodo is a is a great example um and his, and as we as we look at his story, we experience him not knowing, but we also see his heart as a hero to go on this journey. And like, as you mentioned, it's a journey really that's that in in Lord of the Rings and and in Silmarillion, it's, you see echoes of this sort of journey by faith and not by knowledge. And what, what do you think has influenced Tolkien to sort of write this way? That's such a good question. I I I think. I don't know fully would be would be the answer, but I think yeah. his his Christian faith is an enormous part of that. Um, yeah, this sense of Frodo spending his life um, for the sake of something that um, ultimately will um, come at a cost to himself. There's that line where he says that we set out to save the Shire, and it and it has been saved, but not for me. Um, yeah and that's something that ultimately mirrors the um the life and the and the sacrifice of christ um Mm. i think especially today of all days on um on good friday um yeah but also yes yesterday evening i think the the garden of gethsemane um and christ's passion are the ultimate examples of that sort of jesus praying you know if it if it may be take this this cup from me but not my will but your will be done Mm. um again similar to that that line of frodo's that we said and his his cry of um my god my god why have you abandoned me both of those suggest this sort of sense of not not fully knowing although Mm. um as christians we believe that um christ is is fully god and fully divine um there's still that mysterious element in there which i think is something that tolkien is particularly good at tapping into in his stories yes yeah totally agreeing on that and that's an amazing and such a good point you mentioned there as well now some of our viewers on this show may not have read the books um but may have come to lord of the rings through the movies which obviously peter jackson's adaptations are very popular um yeah and 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 did, did really really well and are are a cinematic masterpiece in in their own right um For but sure. in terms of as in terms of how we talked about the valor um from the films you wouldn't really get much of an idea of of, of who the valor really are no absolutely not and you won't from the books either unless you've read yeah. the silmarillion um, yeah and part of that is because of this idea that lord of the rings takes place nominally in our world but it's a faded world. Um, the elves are leaving. Um, yeah. The Valar aren't visible anymore. There's very few references to faith or the idea of venerating the, the Valar. But they do get mentioned in the book. Um, but again, without the Silmarillion, you'd have no idea really who Elbereth or who Arome or who any of these uh, uh, Valar, Morgoth being another, are that are mentioned yeah. because you you don't have the the wider context of the of the world and so it's understandable that those things aren't mentioned in in peter jackson's films i think it would have mm. been it would have been confusing and and possibly detracted from from what makes those good um yeah but that's partly why reading the silmarillion is such an interesting and enriching experience um because you do start to see um, these sorts of heralds and messengers from the unseen world that touch the uh, the story and the narrative of um, of Lord of the Rings. So you'll see elves and even Sam at one point pray to uh, Elbereth, who, which is another name for Varda. She's one of the Valar. Um, yeah. The eagles, in particular, are, uh, are the heralds of Manwë, who is the the king of the Valar. Yeah. Um, and then these Aina that we were talking about earlier on, the, the holy ones, um, who are all part of this music at the beginning. Yeah. Some of the lesser Aina, who aren't counted as Valar, 
are also mentioned and, and play very important roles in the story. Sauron is an Ainu, uh, Gandalf is an Ainu, the Balrogs are Ainu, um, and even Elrond and Arwen and actually Aragorn as well have some connection um, to to these angelic beings as well. Um, but we only get that from from reading the wider mythology. It's not it's not explicit in Lord of the Rings. Right, of course. So, obvious question: Are the Valar a copy of the biblical angels that you get from the Bible? Another excellent question. Um, my my response always to this will always be, um, firstly, no, because as Tolkien says, his work isn't uh, intended as being analogous. Um, it's applicable, but nothing is ever going to be a one-for-one -one copy in his work. So even Eru, I don't think we can compare completely to, to God because it's not intended yeah. to be that way. Um, mm -hmm. They are certainly, though, copies of what in ancient mythology we might call gods with a small g. Um, so those who are described as sons of God in the biblical tradition um, and in some of the apocryphal texts too, um, particularly the, the book of Enoch goes into um, the idea of, of small g gods and the sons of God and mm -hmm. fallen angelic beings a lot. But in character and in tradition, they have a lot more in common with uh, traditional pagan gods who, again, uh, depending on your tradition, you might also view as, as angelic beings, even as a, a Christian, although not probably not good angelic beings. Um, <laughs> but that would be an, an enormous tangent. Um, but the, the Ammon Saul podcast, which is sort of comes from an orthodox perspective, um, yeah. talks about this part of the legendarium in a, in a lot more detail. <laughs> Why are Manwe and Malcourt so important? And thinking of Malcourt a little bit more, um, his his sort of trope or archetype or sort of uh, journey is that his is that necessary to bring that kind of duality to Arda? Yeah, this is a really good question. It got me thinking because with, without that conflict of of sort of light and dark and and chaos and order, um, you you don't really have a narrative. Um, yeah, you could think this with the, the biblical tradition as well. Like as much as we um, hate evil, um, the I mean the story doesn't really work with, without it. So, the, but the reason Manwe and Melkor are, are, are so important is that um, they're the two strongest of the of the Aina that yeah. that Eru makes, and uh, even says that uh, they're brothers in the eyes of the Luvatar. Mm. Um, but that Melkor is the is the, the strongest um, of all of the of the Aina. So um, yeah, like we said, I guess his, his rebellion is essential to the to the narrative, but that doesn't make it good or justifiable, as we'll see. Yeah. Um, but he's got so much potential. So there's a bit where it talks about something of the of the best parts of Melkor are in all the Valar. So he's he's almost this sort of combined um, super Aina, um, mm. like. Um, the Brazilian Ronaldo in like 1996 when he got sold to, <laughs> he had that one season at Inter Milan and people have said he's like all the best footballers ever put together in that, in that one season. But, um, but Melkor falls hard and that's one of Tolkien's recurrent themes in the, in the Silmarillion and, and in his whole, whole legend is that those with the biggest potential um, tend to have the biggest capacity for corruption. Wow. They um they didn't listen to the uh the Spider Man lineup uh, with great power comes great responsibility. No, they didn't. That's such a good uh, such a good way of hiring in another universe. Uh, yeah, no, that's absolutely it. Oh dear, and that and that is such a awesome. I mean, it's been memed to the living daylights now, but it is a really good, <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it's a great one. That one is okay. So Malcor is the archetypal antagonist of the story. Um, yeah. what are his motivations and is he more powerful than Sauron? Um, good, yeah, again, we, we get Malcor's motivations in this chapter. So, um, 
he starts to create discord within the music and that's partly because he has impatience for this void the un- uncreated space and it talks about him wandering in the void alone and he desires what's called the imperishable flame or it's sometimes referred to as the secret the secret fire which mm. he looks for in the void but um but he can't find because it's with the Louvatar. but both of those both of those things come from this desire which we see more explicitly later on to have servants and to be called the Lord um, and to have a land to rule. Um, Mm. And ultimately um, that's because he wants to be like a Louvatar. Um, Yeah. He wants to take a role that's not his. Um, And he is, he's more powerful than, than anyone except a Louvatar at the beginning. Um, And Sauron, who is also an Ainu, um, is his lieutenant he's described as later on the greatest of his followers um mm. but something we'll see especially after some of the Ainur go into um Arda the the created world um is that they don't have infinite power um, yes so they will they will spend their power in specific works and there's some works that they only have the power to complete once and ultimately mm. Melkor will spend his power in uh, wickedness and folly to the point that his his strength becomes less um we see that throughout the story yeah. so this leads to a lot of speculation particularly on internet forums as to whether sauron <laughs> you know at his height in lord of the rings is more powerful than than melkor is at, at certain points in the silmarillion when when he spent some of his strength but um that's interesting but we're, we're not we're not sure i think the 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 thing we are sure of is that at the start um, Mel- Melkor's, Melkor's the greatest and in terms of the origin of evil and that archetype that we were talking about he's the he's the one from which that flows brilliant well that's a, there's a lot in there and we've we've covered quite a bit of ground already but um you know and I hope the podcast audience are really enjoying this it is a treat to have you on Luke um so that is the end of part one of uh this Arda and this creation uh easter inspired uh episode of the lobby with your podcast and we'll be back with luke saw in part two very very soon welcome back to the Law Be With You podcast show. We are with Luke Saw talking about the creation story within the Silmarillion. Okay, so thinking about the light of the Val- of the Valor, um, what is that light that they bring to Middle Earth? Well, light is a really important um, theme throughout the Silmarillion, mm. throughout Tolkien's work, to be honest, but especially during this creation myth. We've already talked about how Melkor goes looking for the secret flame Yes. Um, secret fire, the flame imperishable, but he can't find it because it's with a Louvatar. Mm. Um, but we get later on in the story this bit where it says that um, Eru sends some of the the secret fire to dwell in Ea, which is the, mm. the word that's given to, um, I guess, the whole of existence. So we call that the, the sort of the universe. Yeah. Um, and this thing we've been calling Arda is i guess closer to the the earth in terms of mm. the the celestial body um and then middle yes. earth we'll find out later is a, a specific part of arda um mm. so so yeah again a lot of words um <laughs> but this idea of the secret fire is is slightly applicable to uh the holy spirit yeah um a lot of people reckon um but we're told that that vada um who we talked about earlier, Elbreth, Manway's wife, she shines with the light of the Louvatar in her face greater than any of the other Valar. And she's the one who kindles the stars. Um, she also plays an important role in uh, these two trees that are created in Arda later on, um, yeah. which shine with a light um, and from which eventually come the, the sun and moon. So there's this sense that the, this the secret fire is um, is present almost in all in all living things, and certainly within mm. the spirit of um, 
of elves and men who who come later in a in a similar way to how the the holy spirit works um but mm. the way that light is passed down um is is fascinating we see that from those trees to the silmarils which is what this story is all about to yeah, um the stars to that little um file that the frodo carries into shelob's lair There's yeah some of the the light in there comes ultimately from from the trees which we know comes ultimately from from Iluvatar, from the secret fire so that's amazing isn't it it's a uh, it's very beautiful and sort of poetic myth isn't it it's um very rich yeah high some really high concepts um yeah and uh yeah, it's amazing stuff so in terms of the the valor and obviously like we are talking with, with they are kind of central in this story especially in terms of the power that they have the beauty that they, that they have the yeah and 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 whatnot um after this song and the creation the creation of Arda, um, essentially there is a there is this kind of um, well they they kind of dwell in a different place, don't they? So obviously there's this kind of they're with Iru Iluvatar initially, but yeah. things change after that song, don't they? They do. So after um after the world is is spoken into being, uh, we've already briefly covered some of the the Aina, um, all of these angelic beings, some of them stay with Iluvatar beyond the walls of the world. Um, yeah. But many of them go into into Ea, into the created world and dwell there. And mm. it's a, a particular group of these that we refer to as the, as the Valar. Um, and so through the rest of this Silmarillion, we'll see them move from dwelling in, in Middle Earth to begin with, um, and yeah. then to a land called uh, Amman, uh, and a specific part of that called Valinor. And again, spo- spoilers, but that land will eventually be sundered entirely from from Middle Earth at a later point in the story, which is how yeah. we get to sort of the events of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, where um, these 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 um, powers aren't aren't present in the world in the way that they once were. Yeah. And so you've, you've said as well, uh, Luke, about the, the Valak sort of this idea of a sort of, I guess, an idea of a collaboration with, with Eru in terms of making creation through, through song. Yeah. Um, yeah, with, with Eru and, and with each other as well, um, with the obvious notable exception of, of Melkor. And that's one of the first <laughs> big ways in which he goes wrong is that he wants to do things on his own. He wants it to be all about him. Um, mm. So, yeah, the Aina Lindale is about this harmonious music that the Aina create. And we see it later on with the creation of things in Middle Earth, the best things that the Valar do. Um, the trees being an example are always collaborative. Um, and we see some of that in, in The Hobbit and the, and the Lord of the Rings as well. When, when people act out of self-interest, things go badly. Yeah. When people um, give up self-interest for the sake of, of working together and collaborating with each other and finding a place for diversity in that, um, goodness and, and life always come out of that. I guess Ar- Aragorn, Legolas and Gimli, the, the three kindreds, are a really good example of that in, um, in The Lord of the Rings. Yeah, of course they are, of course. Um, so why is music so in, important in relation to creation in, in this grand epic narrative? That's a really good question. I looked at um, sort of what real life mythologies this might have come from. Um, yeah. It's really, it's a really central idea to the first peoples of Australia. Um, so in Aboriginal mythology, there's this belief that the world was also sung into being um, and People will still commemorate this by ritually participating in song and art um, in specific geographies to remind them of this. I don't know if that's an influence for Tolkien. Um, I think song is important for him as something that's symbolic of his own creation. He's writing these big epics that in some ways are like 
ancient poetry or ancient song like Beowulf or the Iliad. Mm. Um, and so that's a, that's a natural place for, for those stories to have their, their genesis, to have their beginning. Um, yeah. I think music's also important in terms of cosmologically how we then see song throughout the rest of his stories. So singing is always good. It affects how we see people in the stories. Um, the elves are always, almost always singing. But also the in individual characters are like the notes of a song. And, and like we were talking earlier, their, their collaboration causes good and causes harmony and their discordance causes disaster normally. Yeah, indeed. So from that, you kind of get a, a case of uh, an idea that uh, Ardo is kind of corrupted by, by Malcor. Um, and obviously it's come through this media, through this sort of, disharmony this discord and uh that's how that plays out now in terms of thinking from a sort of christian point of view i guess um could can it can it be remade because obviously like in the book in the bible you get the idea of the, the new jerusalem uh in the book of revelation and it's it's kind of a remade earth but essentially it's, it's really like almost like a new earth um mm. do you do you get that sort of vibe in this story that it's create is it a completely new creation or is it just, is it just the world restored again we don't we don't completely know in that much detail because tolkien foreshadowed it and made references to it but it's not something he ever wrote a complete story of and so yeah. his son christopher has has published and referred to fragments of that but um, we don't have a, a full cosmology of what the end of the the end of the world in um, in Tolkien's Legendarium look, looks like. Um, yeah. What we can see is that Melkor does corrupt Arda through his will, um, mm. and although again spoilers for the Silmarillion, he is he is defeated within the Silmarillion. Um, mm. His will endures through those that he has corrupted and through the way that he has marred Arda. Um, yeah. There's a, one of Christopher Tolkien's History of Middle-earth books is called Morgoth's Ring, which is really interesting because uh, we all know that Sauron had the rings. Morgoth doesn't mm. have rings in, in the Silmarillion. Sorry, mm. Morgoth as well is another name for Melkor. I've not explained that at all. I'm really sorry. I swear I, I make it nerdy and inaccessible. But... Um, <laughs> But Mel Melkor Melkor's ring is is Arda in the same way that in the Lord of the Rings we see Sauron pour his will into the ring to the point where yeah. he can be defeated. But while that ring is still there, something of his evil endures. Um, it's we get this same sort of picture with with Melkor. Um, though although we'll see him defeated within um, the Silmarillion, um, the the world endures. And uh, and evil isn't entirely gone while it does. Um, so although Tolkien never wrote a complete story about it, you get this sense of uh, the Dag or Dagorath, which is the, the battle of all battles, this idea that the world will need to be broken at the end in order for, for Melkor to be finally defeated. But like mm. the Christian story, there's, like you were saying, there's this sense that the the life to come won't be this sort of disembodied, spirituality um in the greek mold which sometimes does seep its way into into christian theology i think if you, sp yeah. you speak to a lot of christians there's this idea that heaven is a place you go to when you die and you're like an angel in the in the sky um <laughs> but um but no Tol tolkien's remade world is is reflective of the first one so it's often referred to as a second music that the elves and the men will make with the Aina and with Iluvatar after the end. What a what a beautiful picture. And like you know, like you've said, like there is that kind of idea of um of an earthen sort of paradise. And it, it is like you say, it's not it's not this sort of um Greek sort of abstract realm or sort of you know place where it's not physical. Though it is it is a renewed whether you want to say it's renewed or brand new, it is earthen. It, it is it is a place of dwelling for, for embodied creatures, isn't it? Sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, 
in terms of the actual music of of Middle Earth and of the Silmarillion, what parallels can we draw um, from our own Christian faith, especially as we're thinking about these the Christian faith uh, more vividly at, at Easter time? I, I think there's loads of parallels you could um, you could draw, um, especially through just the, the practice of sun worship being one. Yeah. Um, but the one part that I would really love to draw on is this third theme of music within the Aina Lindale, um, in yeah. which the elves and men, the children of the Luvatar, first appear. So yeah. we get this first theme, which Eru teaches and Melkor makes discord with. And then it says that Eru smiles and Manwe leads this second theme, which is stronger, but Melkor violently rejects that. And then Eru is, uh, his, says his countenance is stern. And his third theme arises, which is unlike the first two. Um, and I'll, I'll read a bit of that, if that's all right. Oh, yes, please passages. do. Yeah. What a treat. <laughs> For it seemed at first soft and sweet, a mere rippling of gentle sounds in delicate melodies, but it could not be quenched. And it took to itself power and profundity. And it seemed at last that there were two musics progressing at one time before the seat of Iluvatar, and they were utterly at variance. The one was deep and wide and beautiful, but slow and blended with an immeasurable sorrow from which its beauty chiefly came. The other had now achieved a unity of its own, but it was loud and vain and endlessly repeated, and it had little harmony but rather a clamorous unison, as of many trumpets braying upon a few notes. And it essayed to drown the other music by the violence of its voice, but it seemed that its most triumphant notes were taken by the other and woven into its own solemn pattern. Um, and after that music, Eru uh, rises again, and his face is, being des is described as being terrible, and he ends the music. Um, and so on one level here, I think we have the history of Tolkien's universe in a, in a microcosm in song form, which, like we've said, is what Tolkien and myth is all about. Yeah. Um, but there's also this idea within the third theme of this beautiful mix of sorrow uh, and beauty. Um, and there's a sense that it involves one of my favourite Valar, uh, who's Niena. Uh, again, yeah. we can't get into into her, but I think <laughs> we see later on why she she's probably got an important role in this uh, in this piece of music. But it expresses something about art and I, and about life. I think that is underappreciated, but is essential, especially to the Christian story. And that's the idea that there can be beauty and sadness. Um, so there's this silly meme uh, which you can find on YouTube called "Orthodox Bird versus Protestant Bird." And it's this little bird singing this Greek Marian hymn uh, that's really beautiful. And it's, tr it's drowned out by this crow that is uh, just singing some awful, like one of those sort of triumphant Christian pop songs. <laughs> um, and it reminds me almost exactly of this, of this passage. It might be a bit harsh to refer to Christian pop music as, um, as, as being like Melkor's music, but um, <laughs> this idea of like this, this beautiful, sorrowful, deep song um that is just drowned out by this triumphant noise that is endlessly repeated um mm -hmm. it's almost exactly like this passage um but in the in the modern world we don't like um unhappiness or loss um or uh, dis certainly not despair um but this this sense of the world fading and that sort of thing like the ideas of death especially is to be avoided and prevented through um, technology and progress or having money um, and this mm. has become quite an ingrained part of a lot of Protestant tradition too so we're recording this on Good Friday which is appropriate um, mm. Good Friday is the uh, the lowest point of the um, of the the eucatastrophe of the Christian story which is bizarre why we call it good as when christ dies um mm. but in, in a lot of protestant traditions that i've been a part of we treat it at least in action if if not in thought as a kind of sort of necessary evil that we have to go through and then we 
get to the happiness of Resurrection Sunday and the victory of Christ um, and the fact that we get to share an eternal life and the the, the triumph that's in that. Um, I mean, I know the church community we're a part of, we're, we're doing something on Sunday, but we haven't we haven't done anything today. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure we're doing anything for Monday, Thursday, yesterday, at least in a in a collective way. But like we've touched on in in the episodes before with with you catastrophe, um, that the idea of loss and sadness is really essential to the, that evangelion that Tolkien describes as being joy poignant as grief um, beyond the walls of the world. Um, and that's probably the most important part, I think, of the whole of the Aina Lindale, um is this line that... Um, Eru speaks to uh, Melkor after the end of the third music. Um, yeah. Where he says that um, I am a Luvita. Those things that you have sung, I will show them forth, and you may see what you have done. And thou, Melkor, shall see that no theme may be played that hath not its uttermost source in me, nor can any alter the music in my despite. For he that attempteth this, shall prove but mine instrument in the devising of things more wonderful, which he himself has not imagined. Um, and that's amazing. We, we see that over and over again in the stories. Like if, um, if the ring isn't made, you don't, you don't get this story of, of the Lord of the Rings. Um, like we were yeah. saying earlier in this episode, if, if, um, if Melkor doesn't rebel, you don't get the fullness of of what the children of Iluvatar are, are brought into the world for, um, and so the idea of joy mingled with sorrow is is absolutely vital to Tolkien's faith. The fact that something as terrible as um, Christ's execution is ultimately yeah. worked into the best thing in the whole of existence. Uh, those you can't separate those things. Um, yeah. And to be honest, God yeah. knows how Tolkien would have made it through his life without that kind of theology. I mean, he had to live through two world wars. He was mm. orphaned at the age of 12. He became a widower later on in life. Um, after his, his wife died, he'd known her since he was 15 or something. Um, wow. Uh, and it's really central to, yeah, pre, pre-modern Catholicism, which Tolkien subscribe to and the orthodox tradition in particular is really big on the idea of things can be joyful and sorrowful at the same time um it's a really christian idea yeah yeah wow luke this has been a powerful episode of the law be with you podcast show um and uh, and such a an appropriate way to kind of come to the end of, of this of this episode um, really thinking about how a lot of these themes um, reflect and, and link well with with our own Christian faith and with Easter and um, Good Friday and as we go through to Resurrection Sunday. Absolutely. And so, yeah. Um, once again, thank you for being on this show. Um, we will we will get round to doing that that Wizards of Middle Earth episode as well. So if you're um, no doubt looking, so if you're looking forward to that on the on the podcast show um look out for it it will be coming soon i know luke you are busy luke also again for the benefit of the podcast uh listeners and audience please tell us your details about your website and your instagram as well please oh yes it's luke prince on instagram for the for the moment is the best one to um to go to i'm uh doing an alphabet of tolkien letters that's sort of been illuminated and i think i've got up to w so that's about to end soon and will hopefully be <laughs> available as a little book or a big poster or something like that. And didn't you didn't you do something on the Tolkien Reading Day as well recently? Am I am I correct on that? I did. Uh, I've got. I mean, I've I've done a fair amount of Tolkien work. So there's some there's some prints available that are, are connected to Tolkien through through my Instagram. Um, but also, I think I read a, a part of Baron and Luthien, which is on uh, on Instagram. If you want to listen to that too. Brilliant. There you go. So if you want to do a little bit of extra reading and uh, and uh, more, you want more and more talking as well. So you need to help then... get him to sleep, probably. You can pop that. <laughs> you'll, you'll be dreaming of the Valar if, that, <laughs> if that's the way it's going to be. Yeah. 
I think it's a very good dream as well. It's a good way. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for being on again and we'll catch up with you very, very soon.